Hi guys, I'm Johnny Chivers. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm a data engineer with over 10 years experience working primarily Monday to Friday in the financial services sector. I'm five times AWS certified and I like nothing more in my free time than making videos for this very YouTube channel. In this series, we're gonna take a look at DynamoDB. We're gonna do the basics to the slightly more complicated. I'm gonna guide you through the theory in this lesson and then we're gonna do some hands-on practical at the end and then build upon that practical throughout another three lessons. So there'll be four in total. Let's just get started and get into it. So what is DynamoDB? DynamoDB is the NoSQL offering from AWS. But what is NoSQL? Not only SQL is a way of storing and querying data that is non-relational without using SQL. So traditionally, if you think about databases that you may have encountered in the past, they're probably relational in nature, such as MySQL, Postgres, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle. And these consist of tables and tables have links between them on keys. If you haven't encountered one of these databases, don't worry about it too much, but it's good to have a concept of what that is before we go to NoSQL. NoSQL removes this concept of the links between the tables. It also removes the concept that your data needs to be normalized. NoSQL tables work off the premise that your data is not normalized. So they could be quite long, quite flat. And when I say flat, they could be 60, 70, 80 columns long. There's even apps that exist that only work off one table in NoSQL, rather than having a model that you would traditionally think of in more all the relational databases. Also, you don't use SQL usually to return the data, or not only SQL. So in terms of DynamoDB, I'm gonna use the Bodo3 library and show you how to write the code to put data in, retrieve that data, delete data, and update it. So what is DynamoDB? DynamoDB is the not only SQL offering from AWS, it's fully serverless, it spans a region, it has redundancy built in, it's highly available, and AWS look after it for us. So as usual with these kinds of services, we can focus on the data and developing rather than the infrastructure. So it lowers that barrier to entry, lowers the operational cost, and lets ordinary people get on with using a NoSQL table. A table in DynamoDB is similar to other databases in the fact it's a place where we store a collection of data. However, this data is not called rows, it's called items. So a row is an item in DynamoDB and items have attributes. And these attributes are the individual data points. So we have tables, we have items, and we have attributes. A table must have a primary key. This is known as the partition key. It must be binary, string, or numeric. So there's only three data type options for your partition key and every table must have a single partition key. We can then make this further unique by adding a sort key. So if we're going to have a partition key that may occasionally repeat, we can add a sort key, which is a second attribute. And then we can have the same partition key more than once in the database, but with a different sort key. And that's highly important because DynamoDB will overwrite any row that you update or insert on accordance with its primary key. So if we already have a partition key or that primary key in our table, and we insert another item with the same primary key and partition key, it will overwrite that existing item. It doesn't care about the relations between data. It's non-relational in nature, unlike a more traditional database such as MySQL, where you might get an error. Therefore, there are some best practices when it comes to picking a sort key and a partition key to form that primary key. The partition key, which is the basis of the primary key, should be high in cardinality. That is very unique. You want to pick the key that is most unique in your data set. And that's for two reasons. One is the update and insert reason that I just explained. But two is the partitioning that happens inside DynamoDB. It stores your data together in groups of 10 gigabit chunks based on that partition key. And you want a high cardinality on that partition key because if you use a sort key, it will store those data items together. And the last thing you want is running a hot topic where everything ends up in roughly the same partition key with different sort keys because then it will take longer to search through your data. So really important, you want to pick high cardinality for your partition key to form the primary key. Your sort key then comes into play if your partition key isn't good enough to be unique. You can add a sort key that then makes the entire thing your primary key. And based on your sort key and your partition key, you have your primary key. 
But what do I do if the partition key and the sort key isn't enough? I want to query the data a different way or I want to insert data a different way. So it's really important that your keys form the ability for you to query. That's where your partition key and your sort key forms the key that you do a lookup on on your data. DynamoDB has thought a way around this and have given us secondary global indexes where we can specify a totally different partition key and sort key on a table. Of course, it still has to be unique within that table, but it gives us another way to look at the data. So we might have a customer address table and it stores addresses and customers together and the customer can have more than one address. So we decide that we're going to use the address ID as the partition key and the customer ID as the sort key, which means we can search that table on the address ID. But we also want to look up on the customer ID because we want to know all the addresses associated with the customer. So we can form a global secondary index where we can do the inverse of this, where I want to look up on the customer ID first, then the address ID. So the customer ID becomes my partition key and the address ID becomes my sort key. And so we formed a secondary global index so we can do two types of searches on two different sets of keys. As DynamoDB is fully serverless, we have to provision the capacity that we want to read and write with. This is known as read capacity units and write capacity units. So I'll bring the definition up on screen now and we can have a read through this. One read request unit represents one strongly consistent read request or two eventually consistent read requests for an item up to four gigabits in size. But what is a strongly consistent read? A strongly consistent read is where we want to read the item in a table without it being affected by any other operations. So DynamoDB has to place a lock on that item and then we can read it. But what's an eventually consistent read? An eventually consistent read is where we can read the data, but there could be another operation being carried out on that data at the same time. But why is that useful? Sometimes we just don't care about getting a dirty read. A dirty read is when we read the data and it's not quite as it is as we read it, i.e. there could be an update happening at exactly the same time that we read it. And that's useful for things where there's massive counts. An example of this would be like YouTube subscriber counts. We don't really care the exact number of subscribers we have at any given time. We just want an approximation because locking the table and getting a read out of it is going to cost more data and cause more issues than it's worth. And then we have WRUs. These are a bit more simple, but again, I'll put the definition on the screen and we can read through it. One write request unit represents one write for an item up to one kilobyte in size. If you need to write an item that is larger than one KB, DynamoDB needs to consume additional write request units. So that's quite simple. You've one item up to one kilobit in size and you want to write it. It's going to cost you one read capacity unit. If you have 1.5 kilobits in size, it's going to cost you two. Simple on the writes, more complicated on the reads. Okay, but why use DynamoDB? So we use DynamoDB when we don't really need our data to have that relational reinforcement. There are occasions where we do need relations between data, but in the modern day, we can get away with this a lot more. We can perform checks outside of the tables themselves and just get on with it. This provides ultimate scalability throughout. So more traditional databases in relational manners have a lot more compute to go on to write data because it needs to do a lot of checks. We are not performing those checks. We can scale massively. So DynamoDB is great for scaling. It's also not complex to set up as you'll see at the end of this lesson. It's a couple of clicks on the console and you're away. And that brings us nicely into the next point. It's a fully serverless service, which means it's fully managed by AWS. We have no operational overhead to look after that infrastructure. Therefore, it lowers the barrier to entry and we can get on with just putting data into a table. But when do we use DynamoDB? So we use it when the relational reinforcement of more traditional databases isn't that important. For example, in web apps, a lot of user tables, sign up tables, that's all DynamoDB. You can also use it for Internet of Things where you want to constantly stream data. So you need massive provision right put, you need scalability and you need it to be quick. And then again, I use it quite a lot in a lot of apps that I develop for mobile. So I just want a mobile app where I want to store some user data. DynamoDB is perfect for that kind of use case again. That's enough of me rambling. As usual, the best thing to do is get on the console and I'll run you through all the things that we've just covered. Table setup, partition keys, sort keys, global and secondary indexes. Okay guys, that's me logged into the console. I'm working out of Frankfurt today because it's a completely blank slate for me. Um, pick your own region that satisfies your own requirement. First thing we're going to do is go to Dynamo itself. So just type in Dynamo along the top as usual and hit enter. Once at Dynamo, if this is the first time you've been in, in a region, you'll have create table here. 
or alternatively, hit the little hamburger menu and go to tables. Now, DynamoDB are in the middle of changing how this looks, so it may look slightly different, it may look the same, but in general, the create table is always on the right hand side. So let's click create table and we're going to create a series of tables here that we're going to use for the next four lessons. So it's essential we call them the same if you want to use my code that I've put up in GitHub. If you call it differently, then you'll have to amend the code to suit. But let's just get through this. There's four tables to create and I'll explain a few things as we go. So the first table I'm going to create is called product and it's all going to be small. So it's just going to be product as so. The partition key. So the partition key is the first bit of your primary key and the sort key is always optional. In this case, we're just going to have a partition key and we're going to call that product underscore ID. We're going to leave it as a string, but just so you're aware, you can have a binary number of string. That's all the options you get. Whilst you get extended options for other attributes such as, as Boolean. So just leave everything else as default. That's fine. Interestingly, just while we're here, it means that the read write capacity units will be provisioned at five units each. That's perfect for what we're doing and we don't need to worry about anything else while we're here. Create table. I'll take a few seconds. Let's create our next table. So create table and this table is going to be called customer. So it's going to be called customer in smalls. We're then going to use another string partition key and this time it's going to be called customer ID and that's underscore ID again, all smalls. And that's everything. Again, we're leaving it at read write capacity of five units and create the table. Next table we're going to create is called order. And that's going to be order. Again, it's going to be a string and you guessed it, it's order ID. Okay guys, just a, a quick reminder as well. You need to be following along exactly um, in terms of capitals and, and names or else the code I, I provide later won't work. Again, just leave everything else as default and create. Okay, another table we're going to create is called order status. This is just a bit of um, setup work. So for the next kind of three lessons, we, we have everything we need. So this is going to be called order underscore status. And the partition key is order underscore status underscore ID. Again, it's a string, order status ID. And we're going to leave it default there, read write capacity of five units each and create a table. This table we're about to create is address and it's going to look slightly different. So this will not follow the default, but it's not that complex. So again, we're just going to call this address. Our partition key is going to be address underscore ID. We will have a sort key this time. So it's going to be customer underscore ID. So what this means is that I, as I explained in the video, a customer can have many addresses. Now, while we're here, let's click the customize settings. Let's leave it as provision, so it's still five and five. But in secondary indexes, we can create a global index, and that means that we can provide a new partition key and a new sort key. And what we're going to do is the inverse. So this time we're going to partition on customer underscore ID, and our sort key is then address underscore ID. That means we can search this table by the address ID, or because we're provisioning the secondary global index, we can also search by customer ID. So it gives us the flexibility in the NoSQL table that we require. And let's just create that oh, index name. So I'm just gonna call this cost um, alley hyphen index and create the index. So that's everything. So it's just customer ID, address ID, which is the inverse of the first one we created, which is address ID, customer ID. And that's create the table. Okay, and you can see then that it does actually register that index on the console here and you can see it. One last thing for today, we're going to just quickly add a customer so we can see it in action. So as you can see, we have no items, there's no items in preview. So click create item. It's asking us for a customer ID. So we're just gonna call this one. Let's add a new string value. And again, this is a new look DynamoDB. It actually only updated over the weekend. So you can see that it looks like this in the form, or you might be more traditionally seeing it like a DynamoDB JSON. So I'll go back to form because it's easier. Uh, let's just call this um, first underscore name and let's call this person John. So this is just a list example to see how it gets going. Let's create the item. And as you can see, we have customer ID and first name, John. So in lesson two, we're going to start populating these tables with data using the Bodo3 library. We're also going to look at the functions of delete, update, and 
get. So that's everything for today. We've got those tables set up. Make sure you set them up exactly using the same partition keys or the code I provide in lesson two won't work. As usual, I'll make all this information for free on my website, www.johnnychivers.co.uk. And until next time, guys, thanks for watching.